Um, can you explain the significance of the difference in our belief that, as it says in John 3.16, that Christ died for, for all, although we know and believe that only those who are predestined and elect, as it says in Romans 8.29, will respond in comparison to the Calvinistic view of limited atonement. Whoa, now wait a minute. You gotta, I was erasing. I gotta get all those verses. I, here I was joking about uh, nobody was gonna ask that. Uh-oh, just a second. You gotta write this down. I didn't think anybody's gonna ask that one. Aren't you related to Joel Beakey? Yeah, he's my uncle. Yeah, your uncle, I knew it. <laughs> Don't tell him my answer, okay? Okay, here we go. Say it again. Um, explain the significance of the difference in our belief that, as it says in John 3.16, that Christ died for the world um, in comparison to, you know, and although we know also that the scripture says in Romans 8.20, nine that um, we are predestined and elected um, and that we know that only those will, that will respond are, are those who are predestined and elect in comparison to the doctrine the Calvinistic doctrine of limited atonement where Christ died only for the elect thanks I appreciate that hard question and um now hold on, you can sit down because I'll probably talk for a long time, but I'll ask you how you're doing. Let, let's first talk about uh, uh, John 3.16, in fact, the book of John, and the usage of the word world, okay? Now I will, I will say this, that, um, that if you're a biblical Christian, that every biblical Christian believes in predestination, election, sovereignty, uh, we believe, because these, uh, uh, you know, for ordination, we believe in those because every one of those are in the Bible. For whom he foreknew them, he also did predestinate. For whom he predestinated, those he called. For whom he called them, he also justified and glorified, da, da, da. I mean, we can go all through the golden chain. We believe in all of these because these these are biblical words. The, the, only, the only problem is that there are some things within, that's on this board, that does not specifically find a statement in the scriptures. It's only as a deduction or a logical conclusion. So let me just start with John 3. And, and so I would say that, that I absolutely believe in sovereign election, predestination, foreordination, and election, election, you know, not even just sovereign election, because the Bible teaches that. And you can never, I mean, you can't demonize biblical doctrines. What you can do is differ on, and I can show you this, that if you take a systematic theology book, and I love doing this because I taught uh, in seminary theology, and I love to show, I love to point this out. These are pages in a systematic theology book right here. And when we are talking about justification, the pages of the book and all these little dots I'm putting are scriptures that are cited. And so when we have justification, boy, do we have a lot of stuff. And when we start talking about sanctification, it's like this. When we start talking about limited atonement, we have this. Because where are the verses on that? Well, they're not. They're all cantilevered off of other doctrines. But now we get to, you know, the depravity of man. Boy, you've got that. It's all over the New and Old Testament. And you've got about the, the security of the believer. And that's all over. But when you get to this one, it's because it's held, it's like a bridge. You ever have, you ever have dental work where one of them is kind of loose and you just fasten it all over the place to hold it in? That's... That would be my opinion of this, and I'll show you why. Because limited atonement is going to be uh, the other side of the gate. If I could move my little board here out, on this side of heaven, you know, if this is the, 
the, I've, and I've told you this before, this is the gate into heaven. So this is entrance to heaven. And the entrance to heaven has John 3.16 that we're going to look at. It has Isaiah 45.22. Uh, it has, uh, you know, Matthew 11, 28 to 30. All of those are just plastered all over the entrance. And basically, uh, the entrance has what Revelation 22 ends with, which says, uh, Revelation 22, whosoever will, let him come and take his part. Or, or just a second, whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. So there's this arms open wide entrance to heaven that's the entry door god so loved the world look unto me all the ends of the earth come unto me all you that labor and heavy laden and revelation 22. that's how god presents salvation to us on earth but god once you're in heaven once i'm there someday if i will look through the back side of the entrance that's the heavenly side. This is the earthly side. This is the side you see from earth. This is the side you see from heaven. Do you know what it says to everybody that looks back at that gate? It'll say, chosen in him before the foundation of the world. The lamb slain before the foundation of the world. The lamb who was sacrificed to take away the sin of all who would put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how it looks from this side. The problem is trying to reconcile these two. It's kind of like um, an antinomy. You know what, and you've heard of antonym, there's antinomy. Antinomy looks like they're irreconcilable differences. So let's just walk through them real quickly. Um, John 3, 16, and we'll do a little word study. It says, for God so loved the world. So the, the key thing about salvation is defining the world. And so the, the rule on word usage is several. Uh, context, so the, the, the usage of the word around the word makes it mean a lot, and what author is using it. Because sometimes one author can use a word in one way that would differ from another way that an author would use it. So you first look in the, the, the close context and you look at the author. So John 3, 16, we're looking at world and it says God uh, so loved the world. And so the, the bottom line is that God loves the world. Okay, so the problem is one way we can get around or that we can come to limited atonement is the way that, that uh, some Reformed theologians do. And what they say is that in John 3.16, the world equals the world of the elect. And so what they do is they define, they add to the definition, they tag it, that it's the world of the elect. So let's see if it's the world of the elect. Let's look in close proximity. Uh, verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So you could say that's elect, elect, elect. It's possible. Let's back up to John 1. It's really close. It's just two chapters back. L look at the John 1, verse 9. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. So I guess you could say everybody that gets light is elect. He was in the world... I'm not sure if you could make that elect. The world was made through him. Now we're talking about the physical world. And the world did not know him. That, that is interesting that, that you could go. So you can't even do this test that every use of world in John's gospel means the world elects. So what you have to do then is, and that's, that's really the, the weakest uh, limited atonement argument. The, the stronger one is this. And I'll just share this with you because I don't disagree with it. I just don't believe it says it in the Bible, but it is logical. We're supposed to love our enemies, right? Matthew, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. Love your enemies. Do good to those that despitefully use you. 
So we're supposed to love our enemies. So I love my enemies, but I also am supposed to love my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's, that's, that's a kind of love that, in fact, you can love someone that's a Christian you've never met before, and you can have a love for them. But I can assure you, that is not the way I love my wife. I absolutely know her, chose her, pursued her, have committed my life to caring for her and, and spending every possible moment I can have. But both are the word love. And so what we can say is that God loves the world with a genuine love. In fact, do you want to see how, how much God loves the world? It says at the end of, of uh, Matthew 22, Jesus, remember over here I showed you that Jesus was the representation of God. You want to know how God feels about lost people? It's actually the last two verses of um, 23. It's not 22, it's 23. This is Jesus talking about people in the world that were not elect because they never came to him. And look what he This is how God feels about the non-elect. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent unto her, how often I wanted to gather you as children together, as a hen gathers her chickens, her chicks, but you were not willing. See, your house is left unto you desolate. And, and, and he goes on. If you look at the parallel passage of this in Luke, he actually is weeping when he says that. He, there is a love that God has for those who will not spend eternity with him that's the same kind of love that we can have for people we've never met and people that are enemies, but it is not the same as the love that we have for one that, that we, we have chosen and we, we sacrifice for and everything that Ephesians 5 says Christ has done for the church. So, does the Bible state limited atonement? No, it doesn't. Actually, the reason why in the theological pages they just have... I mean, you can read. I mean, I think R.C. Sproul, when I hear him preach, I get tears in my eyes. It's so good. It's like I've never heard anybody. I mean, I have sat in the front row listening to him. He is unbelievable. When he starts talking about limited atonement, you don't even hear a verse. It's all logic. It's like bridges in your dental work. I mean, it's very logical. It doesn't say it. On the other hand, look at the same author, John, right here, the one that wrote John 3.16. Look at what he says in 1 John 2. I mean, this is the classic verse. And you can even look in, in most uh, even study Bible references, and it will go on and on and on, but it doesn't say anything because they have trouble. 1 John 2 it says, uh, verse 1, My little children, I write unto you that you may not sin, but if anyone sins... By the way, that was Josh's question. He's going to ask someday, uh, what does that mean? Uh, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for... And he could have just said the world, and then we could have comfortably said that's the elect. But he doesn't say that. He says, not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So, the way, Becky, to get back to you, do I believe in limited atonement in the sense that the Bible teaches it? No. The Bible teaches contrary. The Bible says, look unto me all the ends of the earth and be saved, Isaiah 45, 22. That is an offer to every human being. It, the Bible says that he is the atoning sacrifice, 1 John 2, he is the atoning sacrifice, not just for our sins, us saved people, but for the whole world. That's, that's not theological talk. That's God for the earthly entrance. God is, is looking out and saying, same thing 2 Corinthians 5 says. Paul put it this way, to wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God 
was looking out through his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross, offering Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, and 29, and, and 30, salvation. And, and to help you understand, uh, why don't you turn there to Matthew 11, because I want to show you something, because side by side, with every universal offer of salvation is the antinomy. Remember I told you about antinomy? It's like paradox. Look at, look at verse 28 of Matthew 11. Jesus is speaking. Jesus is offering salvation. I mean, there are a few people that would doubt this. I mean, you'll have some hyper-something people that will say this is not, this is only to believers. But it's not couched that way. And it's not in the context that way. But look at verse 28. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. You're laboring, you're going through life, and you're burdened down, and I want to give you rest, which is a picture of salvation. So 11, 28 through 30 is seeing salvation from earth. But, but look at Matthew eleven twenty-seven. 27. See the antinomy? Look at what 27 says. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son but the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. And here's the kicker. And the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Now we've all of a sudden gotten down to this part, the chosen, the predestined to be conformed, the foreordination of God who sovereignly elected Abraham. Abraham was an idol-worshiping pagan. He worshiped the moon, probably, in Ur of the Chaldees. That's what everyone did. And that's what, you know, that's what the crescent moon of Islam is because it's from that region, the moon god. Why did God pick Abraham? Why did God not pick Midian, Amalek? Why did God pick Abraham? The Bible says not because he was more better or more numerous than the other people. He just chose. See, that you have to come down to it. God picked Abraham out of the world. He just said, I'm going to show my love by picking that idolatrous man who is wicked, guilty, hopeless, dead in his trespasses and sin, sinner. And when God did that, another verse that factors in is Jonah 2.7. You know what the Bible says? When God reached down and saved those Ninevites, why did he save them? They were butchers. The Assyrian people skinned people alive before the Native Americans heard of it. Okay? Scalping. The Assyrians invented scalping people. They scalped people alive, tying them down so they would exact the most torment out of them. And God saved the whole city of Ninevites? Why? To show salvation is of the Lord. It's not people picking God. I didn't pick God. I didn't even have the capacity to pick God. If you understand anything about our sinfulness, we don't make good choices, and we certainly don't seek after God. God came looking for Adam. Adam was hiding. God came looking and seeking to save the lost. Now you say, what about all these people that someday are going to say, I want to go to heaven. I wanted, I wasn't elect, and I wouldn't let you in. That will never happen. Because no unsaved person wants to be saved. They don't. They don't want what salvation really is. And I'm going to close with this before I get in trouble. But Becky... Uh, Romans 9, the last thing I'll say about that is God never actively, God actively elects to salvation. God passively, that means he is hands off those that are going to destruction. Uh, there's a very clear uh, change in the grammar. When he talks about the lost, it says they fit themselves for hell, but I have fitted those who are going to heaven. But I had an interesting um, conversation with someone recently, and they told me, they said, you know what? They said, things are, they said, I'm starting to study the Bible, and I'm starting to realize something. They said, when I was little, I was taught that if you just pray the prayer, you're in, don't worry, you can live like the devil, you can, you know, just 
be drunk and drugs and, and uh, you know, live in immorality. But as long as you pray that prayer, God has to save you. And this person said to me, and the more I study the Bible, I don't find that anywhere in the Bible. I find the exact opposite. Matthew 7, Jesus said, depart from me. You said all the right words, but you never did the will of my Father in heaven. Jonah and many other parts of the scripture say, you can't do the will of God without his grace. See, the grace of God brings us salvation. Grace has been operative in the Old and the New Testament. The first incidence of it is in Genesis 6 with Noah. That's the first time God mentions it, but it was operative with Adam and Eve. Grace is God asking us to do something that's absolutely humanly impossible. But he says, if you'll take my grace, it can be possible. But it'll be because I gave you the power and the ability and the desire to do it, not because you thought of it yourself. So Abraham did not think of pursuing God. God came looking for him and drew him to himself and gave him the grace. And by the way, God gave him 10 tests and he failed half of them. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be regenerated. It's not praying a prayer. It's getting a new heart. And this person said to me, they said, you know what? I'm going to all the people I know that I used to tell them, hey, just pray the prayer and you're in, you can live like the devil. I'm going back to him saying, you know what? That's what I said, that's not what God says. God says, if I have chosen you to be my wife, my bride, part of that is Ezekiel 36, 26, I'll give you a new heart and I'll put my spirit within you. And if you're my child, I will cause you. Do you know why you're here today, if you're saved? We might have unsaved people, but if you're here because you're saved, because the grace of God is enabling you to pursue and seek after him. Now, we have to be obedient to it. That's another question that someone told me they're going to ask me, and I can't wait till they do. There are degrees of responses to God, and that's what rewards are about. But Becky, what else can I say? Should we go home, or are we going to go late? It's okay to go home? Okay, let's all stand up. Becky has, I've said enough and worn everybody out. Um, But the blessing of all this is, if God initiates salvation, if God chose us to be his one and only beloved, if he knows us and, and has lavished his love on us, it says, the last two verses of Jude, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. We aren't secure in our salvation because we're once saved, always saved, because we prayed that prayer. We are kept. Those who are eternally secure are eternally secure because they're held by God. Not because they did something. You know, I, I prayed the right thing. It's because God did something. He regenerated us and lavished his grace upon us. But as long as you live... You can still share the gospel with every single person and say, you, you, if you will repent and turn in faith to Jesus Christ, that's the earthly presentation of the gospel, you will be saved. But we know from here that nobody will even respond to that if the Lord doesn't draw them. And that is an antinomy, a paradox. It's something that we won't know till heaven.